Hello, welcome to mini lesson number three. Today what we're going to do is take the partition function for indistinguishable particles that we derived in the last mini lesson and we're going to actually apply it to a real problem finding the partition function for a monatomic ideal gas. This is going to lead us to get a lot of the results that we obtained in chapter two of Schroeder using multiplicity analysis this time using partition function tools. So hopefully you'll think that the tools are worth it. I think they are, uh, especially when you think back to how difficult it was to get the multiplicity using base space arguments. It's very exotic and confusing and <clears throat> you don't think about it for a while, you lose it. But this is actually quite a bit easier. Definitely, that's my opinion about it. So let's take a look at what we're gonna do ideal gas, I'm just going to remind you. I think the simplest way to say what an ideal gas is, <clears throat> is that it's a gas where the constituents have only kinetic energy. They don't interact with each other, they just have their kinetic energy, and that's that. And so often we would say that the energy of the gas particle is E equals P squared over 2m, and if we want to get the total energy in the gas, we just sum that over all the particles in the gas. But here we're going to do a little bit differently. Um, it's going to be convenient for us to consider the quantum mechanics analog of that simple kinetic energy formula, and that's the particle in the uh, one-dimensional box, where you've got infinite potential barriers as the walls of a box of width L, and then the energy levels inside that box are given by this simple formula, which usually you derive in your modern physics class. I know if you took modern physics with me, I pretty much made you memorize this derivation, and I'm not sorry about it. <clears throat> um, if you've forgotten a little bit about this, there is an appendix in Schroeder. Again, it's also, it's also in a lot of modern physics texts. So the partition function of the gas of n particles has to be obtained from the indistinguishable formula z sub n equals z sub 1 to the nth power divided by n factorial because the constituents of a gas are real particles. They're either atoms or molecules, or if you're a nuclear physicist, it's actually true that sometime you will treat, sometimes you will treat the nucleons in the nucleus as an ideal gas. Um, so our most important job in applying this formula, we know what n is, it's essentially a given, but we need to figure out how to get a useful expression for z sub one uh, of the ideal gas. And so, Z sub 1 for a one-dimensional particle in a box is going to be sum on all the possible quantum numbers n, e to the minus beta e sub n. That's just the definition of the partition function. Uh, again, this is a, a single particle case, not a composite case. So we need to evaluate this sum. So we're going to substitute in this expression for e sub n, where n is an integer starting at 1 and going up as high as we want. We should note that delta n is equal to 1, and so we can actually rewrite the whole partition function in a sneaky way by saying sum on n e to the minus beta e sub n times delta n, because this is just multiplying through by 1. That's cute, isn't it? So now if we consider that this sum is going to go to infinity, we'll convert it to an integral, because for large enough values of n, delta n equals 1 is really small. Um, so we're going to start from 1 to infinity. We're going to say the lower limit of 1 can be replaced by 0. So why not? The difference between starting at 1 and starting at 0 is not very significant. And so now delta n equals 1 is small enough to be considered a differential, and we just have a definite integral as our one-dimensional partition function. So integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus beta e sub n dn. <clears throat> so let's see if we can do this. Let's sub in the formula for e sub n. Uh, and you can notice immediately that all the stuff inside this exponential is not very important except for the n squared. So we'll just call it a constant a. So we've basically got integral 0 to infinity of e to the minus a n squared over n. 
where A is this combination of constants related to the temperature of the reservoir, the mass of the constituents of the gas, and the size of the box that we've put the gas inside. So we know how to do this integral. This is just a Gaussian integral. So this integral turns out to be 1 half square root of pi over A. So if you've forgotten about this, you can go to Appendix B of Schroeder. Equation B dot 6 shows you this. And we derived this kind of expression in our old class notes. So we can proceed to do the integral and just directly get that the single particle partition function for the 1D gas in a box is this expression. I'm going to do a little bit of simplification, basically pull the L squared out and cancel the 2. You get square root of 2 pi m kbt times L over h. <coughs> and if you look real hard, you might recognize this thing multiplying the L. So this is nothing but the inverse thermal de Broglie wavelength that we invented in our analysis of the Sokker tetrode equation. <coughs> and so we can write the whole single particle partition function for 1D gas as L, the length of the box, divided by the thermal de Broglie wavelength of the gas. Such a simple formula starting from such a messy integral. It's the power of the Gaussian integral, am I right? So let's move on and try to extend this to a 3D gas. We don't, we don't think a 1D gas is uninteresting. A 1D gas is something that you occasionally do need to think about, especially if you're in nanoscience or condensed matter physics. So carbon nanotubes might involve 1D gases. But we definitely want to think about 3D as our most important case. But the good news is the energy levels for a 3D particle in a box um, look almost like the 1D case. It's just that you have a quantum number associated to each dimension of the box. You do separation of variables and you get these uh, separation constants determined by boundary conditions independently for each direction. <clears throat> and so if we went through this and just analyzed it using the exact steps that we did in the last few slides, uh, everything is going to be exactly the same. In particular, if you note that you can write the total energy of the particle in the 3D box as the energy due to the x motions, y motions, and z motions, you can immediately see that you have essentially three degrees of freedom, three translational degrees of freedom if you want, and then the partition function is just going to factorize into a product of three 1D partition functions. So the single particle partition function in 3D is zx in 1D, zy in 1D, times zz in 1D. <clears throat> and these are exactly the numbers we found before. So we can just say that the 3D partition function is the 1D partition function cubed. Oops, sorry about that. I clicked, clicked too hard. <clears throat> 1D partition function cubed. And so we'll sub in our formula, L over the thermal de Broglie wavelength, quantity cubed. And we'll now note that L cubed is the volume of the 3D box. And the thermal de Broglie wavelength to the minus third power is just the quantum concentration. So we can write the 3D partition function as the quantum concentration times the volume. Isn't that amazing? It's also amazing that we got both the thermal de Broglie wavelength and the quantum concentration to fall out of this analysis pretty much for free. We invented them by messing around with the Sokker tetrode equation back a couple weeks ago in chapter two. But here they're kind of just presenting themselves as interesting quantities already. Um, and we didn't even need any fudge factors here. And one of the reasons we didn't need any fudge factors in, an, in analyzing this situation <clears throat> is that we've already used quantum mechanics uh, to define our energy levels uh, for the particle in a box system. So let's finalize this. The single particle 3D partition function is quantum concentration times volume. We still need to account for the fact that the gas is composed of n indistinguishable particles. So we need to take this quantity and uh, substitute it into this formula for the partition fun composite partition function of n indistinguishable particles. And so the final result that we get is the partition function 
for 3D monatomic ideal gas is quantum concentration times volume raised to the nth power divided by n factorial. So this is the big result for the day. Uh, this is the partition function for the monatomic ideal gas. We'll be using it next time. And so I'll give you a little preview of what we're going to do. If you look at this carefully in terms of the macroscopic variables that appear, so write out the quantum concentration in terms of its variables, you'll note that the composite partition function here <clears throat> is a function of temperature, volume, and particle number. So remember, the T has come in by ass assuming and constructing the canonical ensemble uh, to have subsystems in thermal equilibrium with a reservoir at this temperature. Um, <clears throat> so by contrast, in chapter two, when we derived multiplicities, they were a function of entropy, sorry, internal energy, volume, and particle number, right? And so the difference between chapter two and chapter six is that chapter two doesn't really think about temperature from the beginning. You sort of put it in later by hand. Whereas chapter six, we already think we have a really good idea thermodynamically of what temperature means. And so we build it into our starting construction. So here's a question. What thermodynamic potential has the same independent variables as Z sub n, namely T, V, and N? Maybe you have memorized this by now. Maybe you've done enough homework. I don't know. It's the Helmholtz potential F, which is U minus TS. And so the topic for the next lesson is going to be how do we relate the partition function z sub n to the Helmholtz uh, potential. So we'll see you next time.